This is Space Time Series 21, Episode 102, for broadcast on the 26th of December 2018. Coming up on Space Time, a new record for the most distant body in the solar system, New Horizons closing in on its next target, and still no word from NASA's Mars Opportunity rover. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have discovered the most distant body ever observed in our solar system. The tiny object designated 2018 VG18 and nicknamed Far Out was discovered some 120 astronomical units out from the Sun, placing it right near the heliopause, the outer boundary of the Sun's tenuous atmosphere called the heliosphere. An astronomical unit is the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, about 150 million kilometres or 8.3 light minutes. 2018 VG18 was discovered using the 8-metre Subaru telescope atop a Mauna Kea in Hawaii. It was spotted by Carnegie University's Scott Shepard, David Tholen from the University of Hawaii, and Chad Trujillo from North Arizona University as part of their ongoing search for the long-suspected Planet X. Follow-up observations using the Magellan Telescope in Chile suggest that VG18's brightness means it's probably about 500 kilometres wide, large enough to be self-gravitating, in other words, spherical in shape. It has a pinkish hue, a colour generally associated with ice-rich objects. Because VG18 is so distant, it would be orbiting the Sun very slowly, taking more than a thousand Earth years to complete one trip around the Sun. VG18 is the first solar system object to be detected at a distance more than 100 times further from the Sun than the Earth. The new record holder beats the dwarf planet Aries, which at around 96 astronomical units now moves down to second place. By comparison, our old friend Pluto is currently about 34 astronomical units out from the Sun. That makes VG18 more than three and a half times further away than the solar system's most famous dwarf planet. Back in October, the same group of researchers announced the discovery of another distant solar system object called 2015 TG387 and nicknamed the Goblin. That's because it was first seen near Halloween. The Goblin was discovered at about 80 astronomical units and has an orbit which is consistent with it being influenced by an unseen super-Earth-sized planet, a so-called Planet X, lurking on the solar system's dark, distant outer fringes. The possible existence of a ninth major planet at the edge of our solar system was first proposed by the same team of astronomers back in 2014 when they discovered 2012 VP113, nicknamed Biden, which is currently around 84 astronomical units out from the Sun. 2015 TG387 and 2012 VP113 never get close enough to the solar system's giant planets Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune to have any significant gravitational interactions with them. That means that these extremely distant objects can act as probes for what's happening in the solar system's outer reaches. The team has not yet fully determined VG18's orbit, and so they've not been able to determine whether it's being influenced by a mysterious planet X. Shepard says VG18's much more distant and slower moving than any other observed solar system object, and so it will take a few more years to fully determine its orbit. But the thing is it was found in a similar location on the sky to the other known extreme solar system objects, suggesting it might have the same type of orbit as most of them do. The orbital similarity shown by many of the known smaller distant solar system bodies was the catalyst for the team's original assertion that there must be a distant massive planet out there at several hundred astronomical units which is shepherding these smaller objects. This yet-to-be-discovered Planet X would be about four times the size and around nine times the mass of the Earth, and most likely on an elongated orbit around the Sun, estimated to take at least 15,000 Earth years to complete one orbit. If it exists, the mysterious Planet X could be an interstellar rogue planet captured by the Sun's gravitational pull. Another possibility is that it was stolen by the Sun's gravity from another star system, 
And there are also several models of planetary migration within our early solar system which suggest that as Jupiter and Saturn migrated out to their current orbits, their gravitational perturbations caused Neptune and Uranus to also move outwards, in the process swapping orbital positions and flinging a third ice giant either out into the Kuiper Belt or beyond into interstellar space. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. With no apparent hazards in its way, NASA's New Horizons spacecraft's been given the all-clear to stay on its current course to intercept its next target, the distant Kuiper Belt Object 2014 MU69 Ultima Thule. The historic close flyby will take place on January the 1st, some 1.6 billion kilometres beyond Pluto, the most distant planetary flyby so far undertaken in human history. After almost three weeks of sensitive searches for rings, small moons and other potential hazards around the object, New Horizons Principal Investigator Alan Stern gave the go-ahead for the spacecraft to remain on its current trajectory, taking it to within 3,500 kilometres of Ultima Thule. The alternative would have been a hazard-avoiding detour, which would have pushed it some three times further out. The thing is, with New Horizons blazing through space at some 50,700 km per hour, even a particle as small as a grain of rice would have been lethal to the piano-sized probe. The dozen-member New Horizons Hazard Watch team has been using the spacecraft's most powerful telescopic camera, the Long Range Reconnaissance Imager, or LORI, to look for potential hazards. The decision on whether to keep New Horizons on its original course or to divert it to a more distant flyby which would have produced less detailed data had to be made this week as it was the last opportunity to manoeuvre the spacecraft into another trajectory. New Horizons formed its Hazard Watch team back in 2011 to prepare for its Pluto flyby, addressing concerns that Pluto's newly discovered small moons could be spreading dangerous debris across New Horizons' flight path. An intense search turned up no potential mission-ending risks. The team opting for the original flight path and New Horizons safely carrying out its historic first-ever exploration of the Pluto system in July 2015. This year, the Hazard Watch team have been conducting similar analyses on the approach to Ultima Thule. The spacecraft's now targeted for the optimal flyby, some three times closer than the flight over Pluto. New Horizons will make its historic close approach to Ultima Thule at 12.33 in the morning US Eastern Standard Time on January the 1st. That's 16.33 in the afternoon Australian Eastern Daylight Time and 5.33 in the morning Greenwich Mean Time. New Horizons was launched on January the 19th, 2006 from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida aboard an Atlas V rocket. The probe made history on July 14, 2015, when it became the first spacecraft to visit Pluto, flying just 12,500 kilometres above the 2,377 kilometre wide dwarf planet's surface. The spacecraft also studied Pluto's binary partner Charon and their four moons, Styx, Nix, Kerberos and Hydra. Pluto is one of the largest known bodies in the Kuiper Belt, a ring of frozen worlds, comets and icy debris circling the Sun out beyond the orbit of Neptune. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. Mission managers say they'll keep trying to contact NASA's Mars Opportunity rover for at least a few more weeks. The six-wheeled golf cart-sized vehicle has been silent ever since being hit by a global dust storm which covered the red planet earlier this year. The mega dust storm began in May and lasted until August. The last communications with the rover was more than six months ago on June 10th. Opportunity was expected to hunker down and ride out the storm. Engineers expected its batteries to drain as dust blocked out sunlight, preventing the rover's solar panels from charging its batteries. However, the skies above Opportunity have now cleared and the rover's been observed still in position from orbit. Opportunity lightly experienced a low power fault, a mission clock fault and an up-loss timer fault. The rover should be able to recover from all these issues once its batteries recharge, however it's remained silent. Mission managers from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, believe dust from the storm may be covering Opportunity's solar arrays, preventing them from recharging the batteries. Since the loss of signal, the team has been listening for the rover over a broad range of times, frequencies and polarizations using NASA's Deep Space Communications Network. They're now performing more frequent communications attempts on a daily basis. 
Glenn Nagel from NASA's Deep Space Communications Tracking Station in Canberra says Mars is now in a seasonal period of stronger winds at the rover's location, which hopefully will blow all that dust off the vehicle's solar panels. So at the moment, opportunity is still silent. The Deep Space Network continues to be able to listen in for signals during particular chances to be able to or when we think the spacecraft could phone home again, uh, uplinks of commands to try to trigger a response. But so far, nothing coming back from opportunity. But nobody has given up yet, and we'll be continuing to listen in for that phone home for many months to come. The real concern now is that the solar panels are covered in dust from the global dust storm, and you're really now waiting for Martian winds to, to blow that dust off the solar panels. Yes, and right now we're getting into that windy season on Mars, at least where the Opportunity rover is located. And that period sort of peaks in December and through January. So these are the good times to keep listening in because the rover is still healthy, but just it lacks the power. Once that dust clears or we get into the height of sort of more summer period on Mars, get more sunlight getting into those solar panels, charging the batteries and getting the computers to switch on again to allow that phone home to occur. That's Glenn Nagel from NASA's Deep Space Communications Complex at Tidbin Bill in Canberra. Since the loss of signal, more than 433 recovery commands have been sent to the rover. Opportunity, or OPI as it's affectionately called, was launched from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida three weeks after its twin rover Spirit on July 7th, 2003. Landing on the Meridiani Plain near the Martian equator on January the 25th, 2004. Spirit had touched down three weeks earlier in Gusev Crater on the other side of the Red Planet. Both rovers were only supposed to operate for 90 days in the harsh, freeze-dried Martian deserts, but both continued operating for many, many years. Eventually, Spirit stopped after getting bogged in a sand dune with its solar panels pointing away from the sun. It had been operating on the red planet surface for 2,269 days, sending its final message to Earth on the 22nd of March 2010, more than six years after landing. Opportunities continued operating even longer, covering well over 5,300 days on the Martian surface at the time of its final communications back on June the 10th. It's been examining rocks and minerals as it's travelled more than 45 kilometres to its current location in a valley leading off the rim of Endeavour Crater. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. The European Space Agency has launched the third and final METOP series meteorological satellite. A 4,083-kilogram spacecraft was launched from the European Space Agency's Kourou spaceport in French Guiana aboard a Russian Soyuz ST rocket equipped with a frigate upper stage. We are off. Metop C has started its journey, flying through the very atmosphere that it's going to be sending us information about. We're heading out north over the Atlantic. And he's telling us that everything's going according to plan. Of course, Metop is going to orbit our planet north to south, so we are going to deliver it on a polar orbit. We're burning 20 engines at the moment. We've got four on the core stage and four on each one of those boosters. Stabilisation correct du lanceur. Stabilization is correct. And the boosters are doing all the work. They only burn for two minutes, but that's long enough for Soyuz to escape the pull of our planet. They are delivering 80% of our thrust right now. Their job, to get us away from Earth's gravity. Those four boosters now being jettisoned. Separation du premier étage. And we have confirmation there from the range operations manager. And we're now burning the main core stage known as the Block A. Stabilisation correct du lanceur. And the stabilisation is correct, all going according to plan from the range operations manager there. Altitude 85 kilometres above 
our planet. The distance, if we were to draw a straight line across the Earth from the launch pad to the position of the launcher, 131. Coming up to the scheduled moment for the fairing to be jettisoned, the fairing being the front, the nose, the tip of the vehicle, housing the satellite and protecting it from the rigors of the launch, things like the acoustic vibrations at launch, which are very loud, of course. Separation des deux demi And we have separation of the fairing, which comes in two halves, which is why he said separation of the two halves of the fairing. So our satellite is now exposed to space and we are officially in space. We are coming up to 150 kilometers above Earth. We actually uh, uh, arrived in space when we reached 100 kilometers, which is the official Kármán line, the official boundary with space. We're now 175 kilometers high and we have separation there. Confirmation from the range operations manager that we have now separated the second stage of our rocket. Picking up speed, close now to four kilometers per second. All going well, all going according to plan. Some 60 minutes after launch, the Soyuz frigate upper stage delivered the METOP C into its polar orbit, and contact was established through the Ethagra ground tracking station in central Western Australia. Once fully checked out and operational in January, the METOP C will join its two sister satellites, METOP A, which was launched in 2006, and METOP B, which was launched in 2012, measuring temperature, humidity, gas traces, ozone, and wind speed over the oceans. The METOP satellites were developed by the European Space Agency under a cooperation agreement with the space segment of the European Organisation for the Exploitation of Meteorological Satellites, which goes under the rather tortured acronym of UMETSAT. The project is shared with the United States Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, as part of a multi-orbit monitoring system. The METOP satellites are placed in 800-kilometre-high polar orbits, complementing the existing Meteosat weather satellites, which are placed in geostationary orbits 36,000 kilometres above the equator. The three METOP satellites will allow UMETSAT's polar system to provide detailed weather forecasts up to 10 days in advance. ESA says work's already underway on the next generation of MetUp satellites, with the first expected to be launched in 2022. An Australian CubeSat was among 31 satellite payloads successfully launched into orbit aboard an Indian PSLV rocket. The Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle C-43 mission blasted off from the Indian Space Research Organisation Shatish Dhawan Space Centre on the Bay of Bengal coast. The mission's primary payload was India's new hyperspectral imaging satellite HISIS, which was successfully deployed into a 645-kilometre-high sun-synchronous polar orbit 17 minutes and 19 seconds after liftoff. The 380-kilogram Earth observation satellite will monitor the planet's surface in visible, near-infrared and shortwave wavelength. It'll be used for both environmental and military applications over the next five years. Following the HISIS deployment, the PSLV's fourth stage was reignited for two additional orbital burns. That positioned it to place 30 smaller microsatellites and CubeSats into their respective orbits. These included 23 satellites for American operators, as well as one each for Canada, Colombia, Finland, Malaysia, the Netherlands, Spain and Adelaide company Fleet Space Technologies. The company's shoebox size Centauri 1 3 unit CubeSat is the third in a planned network for global satellite connectivity to the Internet of Things, tracking livestock movements, environmental conditions, soil and water monitoring, and supply chain logistics. The first two Fleet Space Technology CubeSats were launched last month aboard New Zealand's Electron rocket, and another flew aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 launched from Vandenberg. For the first time ever, two cargo missions have blasted off from opposite sides of the planet at almost the same time, both bound for the International Space Station. The first to launch was a Soyuz FG rocket, which blasted off from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in the Central Asian Republic of Kazakhstan, carrying the Progress MS-10 cargo ship bound for the International Space Station. The space station was flying about 406 kilometres above southern Kazakhstan at the time of the launch. The second umbilical tract, vehicle switched to internal power, Start of the initiation sequence. Engines are throttling up. And lift off. Lift off of the Progress 71 vehicle on its way to carry three tons of uh, supplies to the International Space Station. Everything looking nominal so far. 
The vehicle is stable. Progress is 5.6 miles in altitude. Vehicles traveling at 1,100 miles per hour. First stage burns for about 1 minute 58 seconds before the four strap-on boosters main engine are separated. Confirmation of the first stage separation. Four strap-on boosters have been jettisoned. Progress and Soyuz are 29 miles downrange. Second stage will burn until about uh, 4 minutes 47 seconds. Confirmation of shroud jettison. All control, si control systems are uh, reported nominal. Flight looking good so far. There's a third stage after that that burns until 8 minutes 45 seconds into the flight. All systems are reported nominal. Systems uh, nominal vehicle is stabilized. Everything looking good so far. The Progress MS-10 was on a conventional two-day 34 orbit flight path rather than the now usual four or six hour fast rendezvous flight paths, successfully docking onto the aft port of the Russian's Vesta module. The Progress MS-10 was carrying some 2,564 kilograms of food and other supplies, including 750 kilograms of propellant, 75 kilograms of oxygen and air, and 440 kilograms of fresh water. Progress will remain docked to the space station for more than four months before departing in March for its deorbit back into Earth's atmosphere. Meanwhile, just hours later, and on the other side of the planet, Northrop Grumman, which has taken over orbital ATK, launched an orbital, now Northrop Grumman and Tari's rocket, from NASA's Wallops Island Flight Facility on Virginia's mid-Atlantic coast. The Antares was carrying the Cygnus NG-10 cargo ship, also bound for the International Space Station. And we have liftoff of the NG-10 mission, taking Cygnus to the ISS. We've got engines at full power and uh, nominal attitude. Engine performance after startup looks nominal. Good avionics power, good TVC. Good liftoff and the uh, Cygnus lighting up the night sky and Terry's carrying Cygnus and 7,400 pounds of cargo, scientific experiments, food, and supplies to the International Space Station. North of Grumman reporting good calls on its way up. TVC is nominal. Engines are powered back to 55% power. Altitude 15,000 feet. Nominal attitude. Everything good, looking good so far. Again, this first stage burns for about 3 minutes 35 seconds. Engines throttled up and operate nominal. You have full power. Attitude remains good. Just passing through 25,000 feet. Good TVC steering. Chamber pressures look good. Velocity passing through. And uh, attitude looks good as we pass through max Q. And uh, passing through altitude of 50,000 feet. Max Q is maximum dynamic pressure against the vehicle. Passing through everything still looking good. Altitude 75,000 feet. Engine operation remains nominal. Velocity 8,000 feet per second. And engine operation remains good. Attitude remains nominal, 125,000 feet altitude. Power systems look good. Pump speeds look good at 100% power. And we just passed 150,000 feet altitude. We've started our slow throttle ramp as we hit 200,000 feet altitude. Engine performance looks nominal. And we have Miko. Miko is a main engine cutoff. That will be the end of the first stage, and then it will separate. Confirmation of main engine cutoff. Good vehicle separation now entering a coast phase. And the lower attitude remains nominal. Next step will be fairing separation. We're about 30 seconds from... And interstage separation. Attitude and power systems look nominal at stage one delta V of 17,300 feet per second. And we have fairing separation and interstage separation and attitude remains nominal. TVC battery initiated. And we have stage two ignition and attitude remains nominal. Solid rocket motor of the stage two is now lit. This will uh, burn for about uh, two minutes, 30 seconds until burnout. Pastor 30. The entirety of the fuel will be used around 800 PSI before another coast period. Attitude remains nominal and all vehicle systems are looking good at this time. Vehicle exceeding 10,000 miles per hour. Pastor 30 uh, continues to burn nominally and uh, attitude, vehicle attitude and power systems look healthy at this point. And we've got uh, stage two burnout at this time. Attitude is nominal. We'll now coast for 120 seconds prior to payload separation. So the solid rocket motor uh, for the second stage is complete. Attitude remains nominal as we uh, slew to the uh, uh, separation vector uh, using the uh, second stage attitude control system. Attitude looks nominal and the vehicle is oriented for uh, spacecraft separation at this point. All vehicle systems continue to look healthy. Awaiting payload separation at this point as we uh, are about 10 seconds away from uh, T plus nine minutes. Our systems look good. And we've got uh, Cygnus payload separation. And confirm that the Cygnus has separated from that second stage. The Cygnus NG-10 launch had been delayed twice due to bad weather, eventually taking off two days late. 
Cygnus is carrying some 3,350 kilograms of supplies, including 1,441 kilograms of crew gear, 1,044 kilograms of scientific experiments, 942 kilograms of space station hardware, 115 kilograms of computer equipment and resources, and 31 kilograms of spacewalk equipment. China has successfully launched its 17th Bidao-3 navigation satellite. The Bidao-3 Geo-1 was carried aloft aboard a Long March 3B rocket from the Zhaichang Satellite Launch Center in southwestern China's Sichuan province. The launch was the first Bidao-3 system satellite to be placed into geostationary orbit and the 41st satellite in the Bidao or Compass navigation constellation. Most Bidao launches are now replacing earlier satellites in the system, constellations designed to provide Beijing with a satellite navigation system independent of America's GPS, Europe's Galileo and Russia's GLONASS satellite navigation networks. And speaking of navigation satellite launches, a Russian Soyuz rocket has successfully placed a GLONASS-M navigation satellite into orbit. The Soyuz 21B rocket, equipped with a frigate upper stage, was launched from the Plesetsk Cosmodrome 800 kilometres north of Moscow. The new satellite is expected to replace an earlier navigation satellite which has now been withdrawn from service. Each GLONASS satellite has a seven-year lifespan. Russia's GLONASS constellation satellites use the code names Yurigan, meaning hurricane in Russian. The new satellite is the 48th in Moscow's current navigation satellite fleet and the 137th GLONASS satellite to be launched. SpaceX has matched last year's record of 18 launches, conducting its 18th launch this year, successfully flying a new telecommunications satellite into orbit for Qatar. The Qatari Ezhal-2 was blasted into geostationary transfer orbit aboard a Falcon 9 rocket from Space Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. Ground gas closeout's complete. Falcon 9's in startup. Stage 2 press per flight. Go for launch. Stage 1 coming up to startup pressures. Minus 15 seconds. Falcon 9's configured for flight. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3... Two, one, zero. Ignition. Lift off. Had successful liftoff of the Falcon 9 vehicle as it carries S Hail 2 uh, communication satellite to geostationary transfer orbit. Now we've cleared the towers and we are ascending. The next major milestone as we come up is max Q, that maximum aerodynamic pressure that the vehicle will experience as it goes through the thicker parts of the atmosphere. As we get higher, the density of the atmosphere decreases and there's less and less load on the vehicle. You should hear the call out for that soon. Sonic vehicle is faster, maximum aerodynamic pressure. And we've had max cues. Now we're coming up on a sequence here where a few show. events will happen in very short succession. Those events are MECO, stage separation, and then SES-1. Those stand for MECO, main engine cutoff, stage separation, and then SES, which is second engine start number one, the first of the two planned burns today. And those are, MECO is when we shut off the nine Merlin engines of the first stage, and then once we've shut those down, we separate the two stages, and then once the stages are separated, the second stage engine, the Merlin vacuum engine, is exposed to space and it will begin burning. That will happen over the span of about 10 seconds, starting about 20 seconds or so from now. We go with stage separation. Stage separation confirmed. And back ignition. And we have had second engine start as the orange glow appears to brighten up the Merlin vacuum engine. The next major milestone is on the second stage, and that is when we deploy the fairings that encapsulate the payload. So s 2 is protected from the aerodynamics of ascent by that fairing. Once we're out in space, the air is not thick. We do not need it anymore, so we drop it to reduce our total mass. Bearing separation confirmed. This is the first of the two planned burns for a second stage. This burn will be multi-minute and we'll return to it in a bit. We'll shift our focuses back where the secondary mission, the landing of that first stage, is targeting the drone ship, of course I still love you, in the Atlantic Ocean. Now just like second stage, that first stage is going to conduct two burns in its lifetime. And those two burns, we are about to see the first one in re-entry and then we will see the landing burn. Now that re-entry burn is self-described. It's right before we re-enter the atmosphere. We want to slow down our velocity as much as possible. We're traveling very, very quickly. We're going 2,300 meters per second or so. It's an extremely fast velocity. We want to reduce that before we actually re-enter the thickness of the atmosphere again. So that's what the re-entry burn is doing. Stage 2 is following a nominal trajectory. Second stage is continuing on with s -Hail Sat 2. First stage is coming back. We're about that re-entry burn itself will last for about 20 seconds, reducing our velocity before we get into the density of the upper atmosphere. We are actually engines facing the incoming air. So we're going engine first, and that's why the burn does slow us down. As the vehicle burns 
it's engines that will push us back up and decelerate the vehicle. But Cold FDS gas thrusters that are there to make minor attitude or position corrections on the vehicle. Stage one entry startup. The entry burn has started. Stage one entry burn shut down. Now we're going to go into the second of the two plan burns, the landing burn soon. But it's worth noting that we'll have a very short sequence here as well. While the landing burn is occurring, second stage is going to conclude its first of two burns. Stage two, FTS is saved. Landing burn startup. And there was Seco. You can All right, landing shut down. And there it is. The first stage has landed on the drone ship Of Course I Still Love You in the Atlantic Ocean for another recovery and a potential third refurbished flight of this same booster. Following stage separation, the Falcon 9's first stage, which had previously flown on July's Telstar 19 Vantage mission, returned safely to Earth, landing aboard SpaceX's drone ship Of Course I Still Love You, which had been pre-positioned downrange in the North Atlantic Ocean. Built by Mitsubishi Electric on a D2000 platform, the SL2 is one of the few commercial telecommunication satellites to feature anti-jamming technology. Jamming is a big problem among rival Arab states in the Middle East. The 5,300 kg satellite is equipped with both KU and KA band transponders and is also carrying the first amateur radio transponders to be placed in geostationary orbit, linking hobbyists across a third of the Earth's surface. SpaceX still has four more missions on its 2018 manifest, meaning a record 22 missions slated for this year. SpaceX's remaining launches for 2018 include Spaceflight Inc.'s SmallSat Express, the first GPS-3 navigation satellite for the US Air Force, a Dragon cargo ship carrying fresh supplies to the International Space Station for NASA, and the launch of the last 10 Iridium Next telecommunications satellites. A planned Israeli lunar lander and the second launch of a Falcon Heavy rocket have been postponed until next year. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. The 2018 State of the Climate Report by the CSIRO and the Bureau of Meteorology says Australia is experiencing more frequent heat events, marine heat waves, an increase in extreme fire weather and declining rainfall in the southeast and southwest of the nation due to changing climatic conditions. The study, based on the latest climate observations, provides a comprehensive analysis of Australia's climate and how it's changing. The report found that since 1910, Australia's climate has warmed by more than one degree Celsius and sea surface temperatures in the oceans surrounding the Australian mainland have increased by about the same amount. The findings show that Australia's climate is continuing to warm, with eight of the ten warmest years on record occurring since 2005. Scientists say this warming is being caused by increased atmospheric greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide. Measurements taken over the past 40 years at Tasmania's Cape Grim Baseline Air Pollution Station show that carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere have been steadily increasing, with levels now consistently above 400 parts per million since 2016. In fact, globally, carbon dioxide levels have increased 46% since pre-industrial times. Scientists say CO2 levels are now the highest they've been in the past 2 million years. The main contributor is the continued increase in emissions from burning fossil fuels. The report says the warming trend is contributing to an increase in extreme fire weather and a lengthening of the fire season. This trend in fire weather expansion is especially noticeable throughout southern and eastern parts of Australia. Declining rainfall in the southwest and southeast of the continent was another key change to Australia's climate over recent decades. While Australia's rainfall is highly variable and influenced by major climate drivers such as El Niño and La Niña, there has been a noticeable decline in rainfall between April and October through southern parts of the nation. In fact, in 17 of the past 20 years, the April to October rainfall in southern Australia has been below average, with the May to July rainfall showing the biggest drop, around 20% since 1970. Based on these observations, the report predicts future increases in sea and air temperatures, with more hot days, marine heat waves, and fewer cool extremes. That means an increase in coral bleaching, further sea level rise, and further ocean acidification. There'll also be further cuts to rainfall across southern Australia, resulting in more times of drought, but also an increase in very brief periods of intense rainfall throughout Australia. Humans are known to behave strangely when faced with potential mates. And now a new European study has looked at what happens to vocal pitch of both men and women during speed dating events. 
In 30 case studies reported in the Proceedings of the Royal Society B, researchers found that women raised their pitch when they met potential mates. But interestingly, they actually lowered their pitch when they were talking to the men they desired the most, or who were the most desired by other women. Men also lowered their voice around women they liked. And men were also shown to prefer women with deeper voices, suggesting why humans change their vocal behaviour when trying to attract potential mates. Archaeologists have discovered two ancient Egyptian tombs thought to be more than 3,500 years old. The finds were made at a dig site in the El Asef Valley on the west bank of the Nile in southern Egypt near the city of Luxor. The tombs each contained a sarcophagi, each containing a mummy. They also found numerous coloured masks and around a thousand funerary statues, all in perfect condition. The tombs are believed to date to the 18th dynasty, which spanned from around 3,550 to around 3,300 years ago. The 18th dynasty is noted for some of the most well-known pharaohs in history, including Ramses II and Tutankhamun, better known to most people as either Tutankhamun or King Tut. Paleontologists have uncovered the fossilised remains of one of the earliest known ray fin fish. The discovery, dating back some 380 million years to the late Devonian, was made by scientists from Flinders University in the Gogo Formation in the Western Australian Kimberleys. Ray fin fish account for more than 98% of all living fish today, with an estimated 30,000 species. But they were greatly outnumbered by other fish groups during the Devonian, with fewer than 30 species described worldwide. The newly discovered fish specimen, about the size of a sardine, is especially significant because the brain case is exquisitely preserved, providing an exciting fresh glimpse into the evolution of species. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 